see so many people here. If you don't know me, my name is Heather, Heather Backman. Um, I'm the Adult Services Librarian at the Hopkins Public Library. And I'd like to start out by thanking the Senior Center for very generously lending us their space, the more so as they are rather crowded for space these days, yeah. lending a lot of town department space. Um, they've been wonderful in letting us use this room for our events uh, while we've been in temporary quarters for our renovation. Um, if you haven't been to see us yet, uh, you've only got a couple months left to do it. We're at 65 South Street. We <laughs> hope you've only got a couple months left to do it. Um, but we do hope to be reopening in the fall in the renovated building. We're very excited. We hope you will all join us there then as well. Uh, before tonight's event, I have a few quick housekeeping items. If you have a cell phone on you or if anybody's still carrying a beeper, anything that might make noise, if you could please silence it at this time. Um, if you'd like to take a few moments at the end of the evening to let us know uh, what you thought about the program, how it went for you, we have some evaluation forms on the counter at the back there with some pens. We'd really appreciate your thoughts and your feedback. And also back on that countertop, if you are not getting emails from us and you would like to get emails from us, we have two um, email lists. One is a monthly e-newsletter that you get on the first of the month. They'll tell you everything that's coming up for that month. And we also have a um, program alert mailing that goes out one to two weeks before uh, adult events to remind you they're happening. And there's a sign-up sheet at the back, and you can also sign up from our website if you're interested. So tonight we have David Wallace with us. Um, he's going to speak about a topic of increasing urgency mm -hmm. in our society today, namely the need for all of us to learn how to better critically assess the mm. massive amount of information that is presented to us as fact daily. Uh, David is a Boston University journalism instructor and a former contributor to the New York Times and Reuters. And we are greatly appreciative of his taking the time to join us this evening. So thank you, David, and Thanks. I will let you take over. All right. Uh, hi. hi. This is a discussion, not a lecture class. So fair warning, if you have sites you want to visit, questions about details you want to ask, go ahead. Uh, I'm going to kick things off by embarrassing myself because people who do public speaking professionally say that's a great way to get the audience on your side. Um, factually accurate, potentially embarrassing are some of the details that Heather just gave you. So you have to ask for more detail. And that's the basic trend, theme, through line for the entire 55 minutes that we're going to spend together. Uh, so details matter. I have taught at Boston University's Journalism School. I am an adjunct instructor. I'm not a professor. Key fact, I'm a contract employee. So it sounds impressive, but I don't have an affiliation with BU other than I know that their mascot is a dog. Um, and when they call and offer to pay me, I'll come and teach some kids how to do news reporting. Contributor to Reuters, the New York Times. I've been a freelance reporter longer than I was a staff writer anywhere. So impressive, yes. Not as much as when I tell people I've worked for trade magazines so obscure that You've never heard of them. Uh, you don't get your phone calls returned that promptly when you're reporting for computer reseller news or home office computing. But for some reason, people do take you seriously when you say you're calling because you're working on a story for the New York Times, for Reuters, for a name brand news organization. Um, certain things you're not going to hear me say tonight. Politics. I don't care who you voted for. I don't care what your party affiliation is. All of this information is non-denominational, non-partisan. I'm a Cubs fan. So I get the sympathy vote straight away, except for last year. Media is a term like diet or personality or any other vague sort of descriptor because media is a thing. It's the internet. It's a CD. It's a news wire. What we're talking about is news and facts and how to decide or determine whether what you're getting is news and facts or opinion or something totally different altogether because the intention of whatever that is, like a TV commercial in some cases, is to have somebody in a coat and tie at a desk 
with an image over their shoulder so that it looks like a news broadcast, but it's not. So here are some facts that are particularly depressing, and I don't want to read them to you, but I'll share that increasingly the issue of news literacy, fact literacy, is a problem. People can't tell the difference, especially students have a hard time identifying fact from opinion, information from a website. I found it on the internet. I saw it on the Wikipedia. Is their excuse as opposed to no? Well, who owns the website? What is the source? Is it a nonpartisan source, as in an academic report that has no agenda? Uh, if you're citing a think tank, is there a political affiliation or political action of that think tank? Um, there are several tracks and, and parts of tonight that we can follow. One of them is social news versus regular news, web news. Um, how many of you are getting your news tips or your headlines from a social feed, from a Facebook and Instagram, you know, somebody calling you and saying, you have to turn on Fox News right now. You won't believe this. Because as the Pew Research Center found out, people respond to a social cue a lot differently and a lot more urgently than picking up the paper, where you have to go seek information, where you have to go turn on a TV and sit through it. Um, there is also a big business now in news literacy, in media literacy, in understanding that you can get a fact-checking certificate from the Pointer Institute. Sound sketchy? Anyone heard of the Pointer Institute? I'm a proud graduate. It is a nonprofit organization based in St. Petersburg, Florida that does training for journalists. It is the nonprofit that the owners of the St. Petersburg newspapers gave ownership to when their business model imploded. So Pointer now owns the St. Petersburg newspaper, the Tampa Bay newspaper, and basically is a media organization, and yet they would like $99 from you if you would like a certificate to show that you are able to check facts. I'm not making a judgment. I'm saying everybody's got to get paid. That's their method. They have good training for students who want to be more media savvy. Um, they have many courses in ongoing education. The logo on the left for misinformation and misinfocon was a program at the MIT Media Lab. So very eye-catching, very on the point of Russian Cyrillic letters that look like news, but there too. This is a a business for some people, it's a mission for others. Uh, I'm somewhere in the middle because I need to get paid and, and eat, but I'm no longer, quote unquote, a day-to-day -day journalist. You want to go back for no extra charge? Sure, I'll pay That's, I, I got fingers. Very good, thank you. So, I don't have a laser pointer. Show of hands, has anybody seen this graphic before? Okay. Um, there are a couple of things that we're going to cover in this slide that get us to where we are now. Because what we're talking about is a combination of technology, opinion, the news business as a business has changed, and the roadmap of where do you get your information is like a diet. You don't eat all cheeseburgers all the time. You have in theory, some days better foods than others. This is a map that somebody did late last year trying to map out the political affiliation or the political bent of major news organizations. Liberal on the far left side, conservative slash Republican on the far right side, not surprising. Um, so that's not terribly exact. It's more general. 
but it gives you an idea of are you getting your information from an organization that doesn't have an agenda, that doesn't have a political bias. And political bias is a small b. People who've lived in Boston as long as we have know that the Globe is a more liberal organization than the Herald. But if those two organizations have writers covering an event, you may get different comments from different people. But fundamentally, the car went off the bridge into the water. You know, whether it's an American car or a German car or a Japanese car or a Korean car doesn't really matter. There was an accident. Um, the other thing that would be useful to add to this chart for historical purposes is whether the organization that you're getting your news from has a business plan that depends on you clicking. So how many of you get most of your daily news content from the TV or radio? They sell commercials. They, in most cases, don't have a political bias if they're a network, ABC, CBS, NBC. In cable land, there's a much greater range of political points of view. In order to get that audience, whatever it is, that might per, uh, prefer their information to come with a point of view to not get objective news. So looking at this chart, the organizations that make you click, do they sell advertising? Yes. They have other problems if they're, even if they're in the very center, not politically left or right, the websites don't necessarily have 100% of their own content. They're syndicating content. They're bringing in ads from other places. They're bringing in stories and content from other places. The New York Times now owns Wirecutter, which is a website devoted to tech reviews. So the New York Times maybe is not giving its reporters a chance to do reviews of products and services, but they're getting it from the Wirecutter. That's a problem because you need to know what is the background of the Wirecutter now. Well, it's an independent site and it was bought by the New York Times, but there's no saying that Radio Shack or Best Buy or somebody else is not going to create a library of videos and tech reviews that are strictly for their products because the audience comes to these big websites and then you have to decide can you trust the information? Is it delivered accurately? Fairly is another word you won't hear me say much tonight because my definition of fair is different from yours. Is it just information or does it make you do something? Does it cause you to want to click as in read this for more but there's a link and you have to click on the link to get the story? Are you with me so far? Questions, comments, random complaints? Yep. The top and the bottom is largely on, on size, but you'll see the axis on this chart is complex and analytical at the very top. So multifaceted points of view. Um, intellectual in terms of its approach, the BBC, the Guardian. Um, at the bottom end of the, of the vertical, uh, you see things like natural news, where it's very focused on a particular topic. It's very liberal. It's very conservative. It's very simplistic in terms of this happened and here's why. Click to find out more. So it's clickbait to get you to read more, to get you to read related stories that feed a particular political narrative or a particular point of view. Um, so on the left, you've got Occupy Democrats. If you've got fans or friends in liberal circles, that's where you get a lot of headlines of here's why something happened. Um, often political, often agenda driven, as in this was done to further some sort of agenda, whatever it is. Um, on the right, 
you probably have heard of Breitbart, but some of the lesser known uh, but equally loud yelling voices are The Blaze, which has a cable channel, Infowars. Um, in the center, and part of the problem with this chart is it can't identify everything all the time. There may be an opinion show on CNN where you've got people sitting politely around a table discussing, and it's an opinion. What they're talking about is their interpretation. They've got a lot of time to kill on the airwaves. So you've got a lot of people with time to speculate on why something happened or what the next implications are of this action when they have no blessed idea, but they have time to fill. So they have to say procedurally, well, Bob, what is going to happen next after charges are brought? Well, you know if you've been to a courthouse what the process is for an indictment. But unless there's an indictment, there's nothing happening. Um, I'm old enough to remember that you don't say something could happen in print. Why? Because it might not happen. You don't go with a story, especially not in a large and reputable news organization, saying that Ralph is going to file a lawsuit tomorrow against Bob because it hasn't happened. It might not happen. Bob may take down the fence stop his chicken from getting up early in the morning, whatever it is that was the source of the lawsuit. And until you know what that is in a public document, in a police report, in a court filing, with an action that has occurred, all you're doing is speculating on what might happen or second or third handing information. Right. Yep. Um, has, were all these charges of fake news and uh, liberal news and conservative news, uh, and then unbiased news too, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, how you de how are you defining the news? Because, and I'll give you an example of what I mean. CNN has news, mm -hmm. and then right after what they got a panel of five people, right. actually a little like Hollywood Square sometimes, right? And, uh, and they're all gabbing about what was actually just reported as mm -hmm. fact. Right. Now they're making stuff up and speculating. Well, they're either some are making stuff up, some are are speculating for reasons why. So what I define as news is things that are happened, things that are happening, current tense, things that are scheduled to happen. And my language is fairly precise because I was raised by lawyers. So if there's a lawsuit with a hearing that is scheduled, that's a thing. The next step in a process. If somebody is arrested for drunk driving, they appear before a magistrate, they either make bail, if they don't have money, they don't make bail, and they're held. There are documents behind all of those from an official source. Have I heard some wacky projections of what is supposed to happen or theoretically going to happen? Yes, but I don't consider that news. Until it happens, it's not an event. It's not a fact. It's a guess. It's a possibility. It's a great way to fill time and blah, 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 because it's what I do best is blah, blah, blah. But number one on this list of particulars is every story is constructed. Certain things are going to be left in, certain things are going to be left out. I have had existential philosophical questions with students who are making themselves absolutely tied up in knots over what to leave in as most important, you know, what to frame in a photograph because if I take a picture of you because your purple blouse is outstanding color for tomorrow morning's newspaper, I'm going to miss somebody who's out of the frame. And that to a student who wants to be all things to all people is really just too much. So every story you're going to see is going to have some point of view that is omitted. It's not going to be able to cover every political vantage point, either Republican or Democrat or Libertarian or Rastafarian. But if you want the Rastafarian view of the US election, I have no doubt there is a website that will give you that particular vantage point on what it means for Jamaican's Rastafarian population now that 
something has happened in the state house, in the White House, in any sort of situation. Um, questions about these sort of facts about media messages. And the reason I have used media on this page is it may be a website, it may be a TV program, as in a video that appears on your television. It may be a video that is on YouTube, but not for broadcast. Um, it may be a CD that you get in the mail. Again, the media is the thing that delivers the message, but the content, the news, the information is what's the there there. Yep. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. question, are they fair and reasonable? Right. And that's from, from your and perspective and his perspective. Right. Are, are they, it, it, you have to interpret whether the information that you're getting is unbiased. Mm -hmm. You have to get what you decide is facts, as in, a, an, another example from the classroom, show me an image of a hat and describe the hat. It was green, it was pointy, it was made of felt with a big brass buckle. Don't come and tell me it's an ugly hat because that doesn't help me. So think about the information that you need to make a decision because you're then going to make an up-down decision on is this a good law? Is this a good outcome? Um, is this a fair punishment for a drunk driver? Um, is that a terrible shame? Well, we've got people at the White House podium describing an atrocity. That's a very loaded word, and it connotes very specific things in terms of human rights. You know, wearing plaid and stripes is not an atrocity, unless you're watching a particular fashion network that uses that kind of hyperbole. So is the language in what you're seeing on TV is it loaded with that kind of judgment or that kind of call to action of, you need to call your congressman now. You need to click here for more information. Or is somebody giving you a dispassionate description of what they've seen and letting you decide, is it terrible, is it horrible, is it positive? May I ask a question? Yeah. Have you, um, or anyone, done any studies to see how much of this uh, new media, and when I say new media, I mean the stuff that you mentioned with Breitbart and uh, that, a couple of the others. Um, has anyone figured out the difference between how much truth is being told and how much fake news is being presented? How much is a, is a moving target and it changes every day. So I believe the world is, I mean, if I believe the earth is flat, again, this is beliefs and interpretations. What is fact? If you want to engage me in a deep philosophical discussion of what is truth, that's going to cost extra and it's going to probably involve adult beverages. <laughs> Are there people who have looked at the nightly news on a regular basis, the New York Times on a regular basis, and seen you know, how much out of a 22 minute newscast is fact versus an opinion yeah. and compared it on Fox News at seven o'clock versus, CNN. you know, WGBH, you know, CNN, so that you're looking at the same story? Yes, they have. So um, I would suggest some of the journalism programs, including my own, uh, at BU, at Northwestern, at Columbia, at Penn, at Annenberg USC, there are students doing exactly this to look at, you know, what are the words that are being spoken that are differentiating coverage A from coverage B. Um, you can hear it because people are speaking to you and people are learning differently. Some are visual learners, some are auditory. You may hear a stand-up reporter almost in perceptively, because they're not hearing themselves. Sadly, this is what happened. Obviously, this is what happened. Um, they're under a lot of pressure talking to a camera on live TV with notes just off camera telling you about a car that smacked into a guardrail and killed a teenager. 
and that's terrible. Their feelings are coming through in that live shot, and they may give it away by saying this is a terrible tragedy. That's their personal view. Um, I have, true story, worked for a newspaper that was owned by a railroad company at one time. There were no accidents in northern Florida. There was never a train that struck a car, I was told, because in the days when the railroad owned the Times Union and the Jacksonville Railroad, there may have been an incident or there may have been a collision, but there was never a news coverage because until it was decided by the federal agency overseeing railroad safety, it was not prudent legally to say anything about who was at fault in an accident. So again, who owns the media that you're seeing? Increasingly, larger and larger corporations with smaller and smaller numbers of divergent viewpoints, but you need to look at a particular website that you don't know about, for example, conservative101.com, and look at who the owner is. You can do that on the intertubes. You can't do that on your TV. Um, but here's an example where the exact same story with the exact same photo is spun two different ways for the purpose of clickbait because the people who put this together know that you're at your computer. You're going to flash on shiny objects and go, ooh, interesting. You know, what are the secrets that the producers of Gilligan's Island didn't tell us? <laughs> so a lot of this is manipulative and we are being manipulated until you stop and say, no, I'm going to only devote 25 minutes to reading headline news. Here are the sources that I'm going to go to, and I'm going to be very disciplined to only go to sources that I trust. You may need to look at the level of reporters whose names you know, and you follow them because they're local or because they have expertise in an area that interests you. Um, an example is David K. Johnston, um, who now is independent, but has been a reporter for the New York Times, for the Philadelphia Inquirer. He's won a Pulitzer Prize. He's covered the, tr the business of Donald Trump for nigh on 30 years. So he's got domain expertise that a lot of reporters don't have. I'm going to look at his byline, and I will know that because I was a business reporter, and you might not know that bio, but if you find that person who covers what you want covered, left-handed high school lacrosse expert, you know, follow the people, not just going to the website and assuming that because they were employed yesterday at CNN, they're going to be employed tomorrow at CNN. CNN may just be pulling them for a live shot to do a discussion as they are often now doing with staffers from the Post, the Times, the mainstream large print news outlets, or the wires. Here are other clues that you are being drawn to or pushed to sites that are not legit, as MC Hammer told us so wisely. So there are domain manipulators. There are sites that are just one letter off, but they're really on a New Zealand server. So if you go to .nz, it's not the same as a .biz domain, which is legitimate and may be an actual business. So the example that I use is abcnews.com.co is a web server in Colombia by somebody who decided, well, we could put ABC News in really bold, all caps. People will think, because they read left to right, that it's the proper place. But in fact, ABC News uses the domain go.com. So if it looks similar, if they have the graphics that are red, white, and blue, maybe it's USA Today, maybe it's usanewstoday.com, which is a spoof site, not the actual newspaper that's owned by Gazette. If I use the, the geek term filter bubble, does that sound familiar to you? Do you know what that is? No. Would you like to see a video that explains what it is? Yeah. Basically, 
the concept behind the filter bubble, and I'll ruin the surprise ending, is the fact that unlike TV news, unlike newspapers, what you see on the internet is driven by what you've already seen or clicked on on the internet. And this is called a filter bubble. What you click on is searched, saved, cookied, tracked. So it's not surprising that companies have figured out that they can capitalize on this because I know who drives a Mac and who drives a PC. True story. Orbitz got in some serious trouble charging more money to people who owned Macs for certain travel because the perception was they had more money. Um, I forget the name of the college prep organization that had figured, I think it, well, I'm not going to say because I don't remember exactly, but recently within the past couple of months, there was geo-targeting on top of filter bubble targeting that a college prep organization had figured out that they were going to raise the price for Asian families in several cities in the Northeast because they were more likely to be shopping college prep courses for their kids. And that was a more likely audience. Let's see if we get enough audio for hearing what Eli has to say. Mark Zuckerberg, a journalist, was asking him a question about the news feed. And the journalist was asking him, you know, why is this so important? And Zuckerberg said, a squirrel dying in your front yard may be more relevant to your interests right now than people dying in Africa. And I want to talk about what a web based on that idea of relevance might look like. So when I was in a, in a really rural area in Maine, you know, the internet meant something very different to me. It, it meant uh, a connection to the world. It meant something that would connect us all together. And I, I was sure that it was going to be great for democracy and for our society. But there's this kind of shift in how information is flowing online. And it's invisible. And if we don't pay attention to it, it could be a real problem. So I first noticed this uh, in a place I spend a lot of time, my Facebook page. I'm progressive politically, big surprise. But I've always uh, you know, gone out of my way to meet conservatives. I like hearing what they're thinking about. I like seeing what they link to. I like learning a thing or two. And so I was kind of surprised when I noticed one day that the conservatives had disappeared from my Facebook feed. And uh, what it turned out was going on was that Facebook was looking at which links I clicked on. And it was noticing that actually I was clicking more on my liberal friends' links than on my conservative friends' links. And without consulting me about it, it had edited them out. They disappeared. So Facebook isn't the only place that's doing this kind of invisible algorithmic editing of the web. Google's doing it too. If I search for something and you search for something, even right now at the very same time, we may get very different search results. Even if you're logged out, one engineer told me, there are 57 signals that Google looks at. Everything from what kind of computer you're on to what kind of browser you're using to where you're located that it uses to personally tailor your query results. Think about it for a second. There is no standard Google anymore. And you know, the funny thing about this is that it's hard to see. You can't see how different your search results are from anyone else's. But uh, a couple of weeks ago, I asked a bunch of friends to Google Egypt and to send me screenshots of what they got. So here's my friend uh, Scott's screenshot. And here's my friend Daniel's screenshot. When you put them side by side, you don't even have to read the links to see how different these two pages are. But when you do read the links, it's really quite remarkable. Daniel didn't get anything about the protests in Egypt at all in his first page of Google results. Scott's results were full of them. And this was the big story of the day at that time. That's how different these results are becoming. So it's not just Google and Facebook either. You know, this is uh, something that's sweeping the web. There are a whole host of companies that are doing this kind of personalization. Yahoo News, the biggest news site on the internet, is now personalized. Different people get different things. 
Huffington Post, the Washington Post, New York Times, all flirting with personalization in various ways. And where this, this moves us very quickly toward a world in which the internet is showing us what it thinks we want to see, but not necessarily what we need to see. As Eric Schmidt said, it'll be very hard for people to watch or consume something that has not in some sense been tailored for them. So I do think this is a problem. And uh, I think if you take all of these filters together, if you take all of these algorithms, you get what I call a filter bubble. And your filter bubble is kind of your own personal, unique universe of information that you live in online. And what's in your filter bubble depends on who you are, and it depends on what you do. But the thing is that you don't decide what gets in. And more importantly, you don't actually see what gets edited out. So one of the problems with the filter bubble was discovered by some researchers at Netflix. And they were looking at the Netflix cues and they noticed something kind of funny that a lot of us probably have noticed. What we're seeing is more of a passing of the torch from human gatekeepers to algorithmic ones, sweating a lot about their civic responsibilities. Then people kind of noticed that they were doing something really important. That in fact you couldn't have a functioning democracy if citizens didn't get a good flow of information. That the newspapers were critical because they were acting as the filter and that journalistic ethics developed. It wasn't perfect, but it got us through the last century. And so now, we're kind of back in 1915 on the web. And we need the new gatekeepers to encode that kind of responsibility into the code that they're writing. You know, I know there are a lot of people here from Facebook and from Google, Larry and Sergey, who, you know, people who have helped build the web as it is, and I'm grateful for that. But we really need to you to make sure that these algorithms have encoded in them a sense of the public life, a sense of civic responsibility. So that's a good introduction to the concept of a filter bubble is you don't know what you're missing and you may not know if your sources of information, even from the same website, at the same time have the same information. Um, so the next part of this is what do you do about it? What can you do to fact check the information that you're getting, that it's legitimate. Um, yes, from most news organizations, they do run corrections, they do update things when the information that they have is superseded because <coughs> there are certain things that are a fact today that are gonna be a fact tomorrow. There are other things that are a fact today that may be corrected or changed or interpreted or spun tomorrow. So here are a couple of examples of websites that allow you to get more information. If you go to a site like Whois or Better Who Is, you can see who owns the domain of the site you're clicking on. Um, these are sites that are current as of May 2017. They may be expanded or changed. There are some others on the next slide uh, if anyone wants a copy of this list, I can email it to you. Um, the next as a list is organizations now are getting in the mindset of doing the fact checking on media in real time. Um, the Pew Trusts, you may have heard during campaign season, PolitiFact, um, some of the the academic, either political or media schools that are making this a sideline business. Getting back to media literacy, political literacy, understanding the civics lesson of how things work because there are people making claims about procedural steps or what should have been done under the law that aren't being done and in fact they're not experts they're not really talking from experience. They're wishing and hoping and praying in some cases for things that may or may not happen, like rain tomorrow. So all of these are sites that are helpful. 
your judgment counts because you've got to decide whether this attention is fair, whether the amount of time and money and hot air being devoted to whatever the topic is suits your interest or push the button, step away from the screen and get on with your day, which I strongly encourage. It's a great coping mechanism. Um, if there are questions about either of the, the pages of sites, I'm happy to do show and tell. Um, if there are sites that you would like to check because you've seen something that's questionable, um, we can see if the, if the pages are live, as in the web still has them on the web connection. Um, there is the Wayback Machine and Alexa and certain sites that archive previous web gaffes, um, what a website looked like in 2011, because that was really nice ride in the Wayback Machine at Eli Pariser's TED Talk of this is what a browser window looked like six or seven years ago. Um, if you're really devoted to whatever your subject is, you can get every web page update for the Gilligan's Island fan page or every iteration of fill in the blank page as it's refreshed and updated and stories are pulled down or changed on the fly but you may not see it corrected. You may not see a correction as in the news organization saying this is a corrected copy. Some of them do, some of them don't. In terms of you can wash and wax on the web as you go. There's no need for you to say, sorry, the news st story that I put up at 10 after 6 was incorrect. All that you have to do is put the information up there and say that this page was refreshed at 8.03 and this is the information that is correct as of now. You often see that in mass casualty incidents where there's a number of injured or a number of dead or there's more information about the cause of a plane crash, a train crash, uh, a natural disaster that's weather related. Excuse me? Yep. Um, two questions. Number one, do any of these deal with anything that's international, these all in the um, United States? And number two, I, saw, I did see some of them was, uh, got, you know, well, no, it's okay. I'll let that stand. The, the second thing was, what happens with pictures? I get concerned about things that are photoshopped and taken out of context and to, to um, and, yeah. Well, shopped or not is a site on that. You can take an image and in some cases analyze the image to see if it's been altered. Um, there isn't a site that will tell you when you get to X news story and there's a photo of the Pope that the Pope is related to that news story. It's a common device to put racy photos, photos of well-known celebrities, because they're clickable. You assume that they're connected, but they're not. They're merely proximate. Um, to your first question of are there international fact-checking sites, it, it depends. I mean, that's the best lawyer answer I can give you. There aren't necessarily country by country to know that if you are interested in news from Malta, we are going to be monitoring the Maltese news media. Um, there are sites that do selectively look at The Guardian, look at inter big international news organizations like Al Jazeera, um, Agence France Press, to see if there's an agenda, especially if they're state-owned, like an airline. Um, but there's no way, for example, to go back to the one about the pictures, as I, I am interested in particularly what you're saying now, but if, um, it's not so much that the picture has been changed, but um, that there's no way to find out whether the view that has been taken of something that looks like somebody is doing something, they're doing something from an angle so that it appears that they're doing something because you're dealing with a distance and a near, far, proximal you know, type thing, you can't tell. It looks like something is happening. Oh, yeah. The picture hasn't been changed. It's just the way that picture's been taken. Absolutely. Or the view or the angle or whatever is designed to make you perceive something. Does anybody know that? That's, that's apparently mm -hmm. the biggest thing you do when you go to the Leaning Tower in Pisa. Mm -hmm. Because you can take a shot of Uncle Earl 
you know, and forced perspective, I don't think there's an answer to that. Um, there's ways to analyze it if you're a user of Photoshop, if you're able to grab the photo and analyze it for layers or analyze it for point of view. What, what some news organizations will do is take multiple shots of a particular incident. And the one that occurs to me is the plane that landed at San Francisco airport and was damaged and burst into flames. So it was speculation of was it landing short? Was it damaged before it hit the runway? Was it on fire before it touched the ground? So those were things that you had to look at from different points of view so that investigators, and again, this is happening in almost real time. You know, the NHTSA investigation of an air crash takes weeks, months, but there were people analyzing that plane's video and still photography minute by minute to see what they could rule in and rule out based on what they could get. Um, another factor is who shot the pictures? You know, are they coming from Bob, the conspiracy theorist who wants you to believe that Elvis was on that plane, or Taylor Swift, for those of you under 30, um, mm -hmm. or is it shot by a news photographer who is authorized? Um, whose photo are you going to believe? More questions? More sites? This is an interesting headline from today. Um, there's a great book by uh, Professor George Lakin called Don't Think of an Elephant. Show of hands. Who just did? So if Facebook tells you they're going to solve fake news, gee, we should click on that, right? Because tonight I'm going to a thing about fake news. What The Guardian is telling you is there are partners, there are diligent people trying to root out fake information from Facebook, but it's not going to stop people from clicking if Aunt Gert sends you a link that is too good to be true that the Grateful Dead are back together, Jerry's come back to life, and they're going back out on tour. It, that may not be possible, but it can't stop you from clicking. And the tantalizing prospect that Jerry has come back to life to play guitar again is really awesomely epic. And you're not sure. You, you've got that moment of doubt where you're thinking, oh, it could happen. But The Guardian and some other organizations now have media debunkers, media watchers, who are doing some of this coverage to identify who gets a thumbs up and a thumbs down. Um, who is a source that's useful and helpful on breaking news versus who's just going to blah, blah, blah all night because they don't have information and the producer's voice in their ear is not giving them anything new to, to work with. Uh, other sites we should visit, other news that may or may not be things you want to know more about? I have a question on that bubble. Yeah. On Facebook, which I don't use a whole lot, I was then perceiving that it has done something to me. Mm -hmm. And this is what it did to me. <laughs> yeah. Which is really weird, because I, I would like to think, um, I'd like to look at another side's perspective in what's happening in the world, but nothing comes to me about that. It only comes to my, some, my perspective is the only thing that comes to right. me. Right. Some organizations are doing something like that. The Washington Post has Red Blue. Um, there are other news organizations that are putting at the bottom of their web page, you know, if you like this article, click on this link to see the other vantage point of a certain set of events, to see a different point of view. Um, my preference is local. Get as local to the information as you can to get information because the national organizations don't know fill in the blank town as well as the local news, the local TV, the community newspaper. Um, they don't know the people and they don't have the, the background because they're writing for a broader audience. Um, if you don't see the point of view in what you're reporting, a good rule of thumb is you can go back to that chart at the first of 
Infowars telling you that something happened to Hillary Clinton, well, okay, Google as specifically as you can, email server Hillary Clinton, and then look at split screen, awfully useful helps as well. You'll see certain words that are trigger because they're emotionally loaded, you know, uh, what was illegal or what was immoral or fattening is often in the copy when you go see what the other side said about a certain or opinion. Yeah? Is there anyone collecting data that shows maybe that people are becoming more careful about their news? Is anybody looking to see whether people are more curious about their news and are following up by doing some investigation on their own? Is anybody looking at that? Um. I'm sure they are, but they're looking at it through lots of different telescopes. So you've got local news like Gatehouse Media trying desperately to remain a local newspaper or a local news website. Um, it's hard to say what news consumption is because it varies so widely. It was easy in the days of TV broadcast news to say, okay, how many of you are sitting down to watch the 6 o'clock news, the 10 and the 11 o'clock broadcast? Now you've got giant swaths of four hours of local news from 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. Yeah. Are you watching it? No. Not really. You're probably mixing your hot cocoa and doing other things, and it's background noise. For the purposes of advertising prices, that station wants to say that you're a viewer. So it's, it's very hard because it's a very squishy topic. Um, there are organizations that are trying to prove we have more local news as opposed to we have more people watching or listening or interacting. Um, so everybody is trying for their own purpose, whether it's a business model, you know, getting more people to vote. Uh, there are lots of different metrics that you use to decide whether news consumption is up or down. That, yeah. That's not really my question. My question is, for example, before I came tonight, I did Google to see who you were. Okay. And what I'm saying is, it's with our internet and with the way kids are today, when I see something on TV or on the news that I question, I immediately go and look for the source. Like last week, there was a thing on the news that said women in the United States are six times likely, more likely to die in childbirth. That's interesting. So I followed up and I and the This is this thing that we should be doing, and are we actually bringing that forward with the population? I don't know that there's an answer to the question of, are, is anybody studying this? Right. The answer is they're trying to get this to be a habit. So if you're a student, to go beyond primary to secondary and third sources, um, to fact check what you're hearing, because the other thing that is happening is at the opposite end of the spectrum, there's the ability of people to say, I don't believe anything. Yeah. Up is down, night is day, black is white, dogs are cats. And if I don't believe it, nobody can make me believe. So somewhere in the middle of those two very divergent opinions where you can fact check at the one extreme, you can deny everything at the other extreme, there are lots of shades of gray and there are lots of people who are more or less interested by their news consumption to be able to get more information, you know, to go deeper into a story. So there are uh, websites that are devoted to deep dives by topic 
on medical, on environmental, and that's the new journalism. It's not place-based. It's not golf magazine or fishing magazine. It's a website devoted to global environmentalism, brought to you by whoever will underwrite it and not by an organization that has a stake, like Sierra Club or Greenpeace. How do you uh, answer some of the calls? Uh, I did mention CNN earlier about uh, how they do the newscast, then they do the opinion cast. But how do you uh, differentiate that with younger students, uh, like say high school or junior high school? Uh, it seems to me that they need to hear this stuff, that uh, what an opinion is and what a fact is, and what a news report is and what an editorial is. Mm -hmm. So they're not, it doesn't seem like they're getting it. Um, that is true, comma, but. Um, there are, this is old information, but for example, the, the um, campus at Stony Brook has essentially a critical thinking course and media literacy that's required for all students. Um, students who were raised to be curious to go and look at a textbook or go to the library and ask a research librarian have a lot better ability to sort out critical facts than somebody who comes home and says, you know, Mr. Hendricks told me that up is down and night is day and cats are dogs, and he's my teacher, so I believe it. Um, there are, again, you know, lots of different ways that you teach this. Part of it is don't believe everything that you read on the internet. Um, part of it is the, tr the tough love of the Chicago journalism lesson, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. <laughs> you know, you need two sources from independent verification in most news stories. That is the standard by which a story gets on network TV, the major national news organizations, or the wires, unless somebody was there to say, this plane hit the ground, it went boom, I saw it, and I'm a news reporter, you should take my word for it. Um, so in, in lots of cases, what's the, it, it becomes a case of how far are you able to devote your time and effort into proving certain facts and figures. Um, a lot of students are not willing to do it because they take everything at face value unless they're told, no, you need to come up with a source that isn't Wikipedia or the internet for your term paper, you know, little Johnny. Um, you need to crack open a textbook or talk to a, you know, an expert in the field. I'll go to the library. Right, yes. right answer. Yes. Job security for research librarians. Um, and unfortunately, there are fewer and fewer of them because they, you know, they're not fewer in number, but they are fewer in terms of being a resource. People don't think about it other than, can you point me to where the DVDs of the movies are because I want to find a, you know, uh, uh, entertainment for Saturday night, well, but now that. You tell us. This but, town just expanded to a twenty-two thousand square foot library. Congratulations. September, well done. We're From, very excited. What was it before? Five or seven thousand? Uh, somewhere in there. I want. I wanted to say six. So. It's going to be a social center too. Yeah. So uh, the the nature of the library is changing. So a lot of information that you get at home on your computer means that the library has to step up its game and get specialized information or access to databases that are expensive or very specialized that Maybe not everybody can get with you know, a standard email search. Just be the steward of a town's information for perpetuity. I think that's what we're seeing them turn into now. But they've always been that, I think. You, know, you go back to Alexandria. Uh, this, you know, they may, if you have room for city hall's records and becoming a, you know, a sort of civics lesson of this is how you get a building permit. We, we have, um, we do have a lot of historical archives. We're partnering with the historical society. We've been talking about partnering with the town clerk. That's one of our initiatives is the local history. But I think, you know, especially with things like this, we're also hoping to remind people that if you have a question and if you can't figure it out or if you're not sure that there are people who have training and you know master's degree level education who can sit down with you and help you find out you know is this really credible is this not where can I look where can I find this out um, I've had people come to me 
saying, you know, I'm trying to figure this thing out. I can't find it. They've been all over Google. I pull it up for them in five minutes because I know the tips and the tricks that, you know, that not everybody knows. They're sort of specialists. Um, I think, you know, more people need to realize that we can do that for them. Boolean search is not for amateurs. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> or even just knowing, you know, all these sites you put up. I didn't even know some of them, but I know, you know every library I know keeps a running list of, you know, here's some great resources that probably nobody's ever heard of except for, you know, six librarians. <laughs> there are lots of others on the Shorenstein Center from Harvard, uh, the MIT Media Lab. I mean, this is getting to be an ongoing activity both in education fields and research but also in you know general studies uh, is compiling pieces of information and a bunch of people who get mad as hell and say I'm not going to take this anymore I'm going to put a website together I'm going to put a slide deck together and take my act on the road so thanks for having me just as a comment the my daughter's in eighth grade and they did do a unit on on fake news this Wonderful. Year. So mm -hmm. they did, and they had good. like two art, right, articles, and you had to read the two and kind of good. do some critical thinking about. Let's just say there's a lot of arguing back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, another thing that I started this, uh, what I do, hopnews.com, in 2003, and we grew very fast. And then we had uh, a tragedy in town where a man from Britain moved here 10 days before he killed his family. And uh, being in town here myself, I, ha I had everything, and there, there were some things that, just as an aside, this isn't where I'm getting to, but as an aside, uh, I had information I did not reveal, and everyone I've known in the business uh, has said, oh no, if you have the information, you have to make it public. I said no, because this guy would have would have fled if he knew they were testing his guns, because he put the gun back, the, the murder weapon, in the collection, so he had to be a sociopath, a psychopath. So, where did the uh, where where did um, the line where did I cross the line? Everyone's told me no. You have to get the information out now. I, one of the national correspondents today, uh, CBS, I believe it was, said something about uh, the um, that uh, they weren't going to tell the town or the locale or the area where Trump had uh, gotten his intelligence uh, and where they had gotten the intelligence about the laptop bombs. Uh, then I see, oh, it was yesterday, then I see Colbert tell him, tell him the, uh, yeah, the location was Israel, he said. Um, that, and that's just an aside, but just to give a little of my perspective, if you don't mind, by the way, I've enjoyed your, uh, I've enjoyed your talk. Um, but we've seen Facebook uh, and other organizations that aren't as professional, if I may say so, um, take our information. Um, one in particular said, breaking news, you know, and then news sources say. Whenever I say new, I see news sources say, uh, whatever I'm reading loses, uh, loses my interest. It, it, there's no question that anonymous sourcing is a problem, mm -hmm. that trust is a problem, that timely information because news websites know whatever the most popular links are there's no charge to leaving them as live links so you've got to then look at the top of the story and say well that was an interesting headline but it's a three-year-old story about a restaurant that closed or about something that's that's happened um, I've worked for organizations that have that affirmative duty to disclose, uh, a lot of these are judgment calls. So if you're at risk of impeding a legal investigation or withholding information, that's a whole separate journalism ethics and legal discussion for another time. But there's no serious question that everybody in the news business wants to have an edge or wants the yeah. audience to believe that they have better, faster, stronger sources. And even in the case of a, a at par, everybody has the same information. You, you have to go out and try and get more recent, more better, higher profile names. That's what keeps people making phone calls.
Yep. Is Giselle Bunchen a good source that Tom Brady played right. with a concussion? <laughs> that, uh, today's news of, you know, Dr. Bunchen has diagnosed him as having a, yeah. a concussion. Um, and played, yeah. You know, I, I, as good as any. Um, it, it's information that might not have come out from the Patriots organization. Um, it, it, we may never know unless he decides to disclose medical records, but it gives us what to talk about of is it true, is it not? You know, was he a little groggy because the green goo he was eating that day, you know, was a little past its sell by date? Um, we may never know, but you know, it, it gives us what to discuss and, and what to wonder about. I'm wondering what she, how she came. To pay, to right, that. yeah. To, to, to um, well, as I know, the wife is always right. This <laughs> <laughs> is a very private the, person. The, the correct answer there is yes, dear. <laughs> I, I should stop while I'm ahead. And I, and I have yes, dear recorded somewhere. <laughs> Driving here on the radio, Secretary said that the Patriots organization has no information about him ever having a concussion. They have nothing on the record. so. Okay, if it wasn't official, it never happened unless his doctor personally says otherwise. Unless somebody has diagnosed him and has a paper record of it. Otherwise, it gives us what to speculate about. Do you want to push the button and make the rest of the evening off the record? 